Okay, this is a quick introduction to the Luminex software. We're gonna see how uh, you can uh, use uh, the software to enter the information about your experiment. Uh, things that you are going to need include the uh, protocol booklet, as well as the certificate of analysis that came uh, with each of your kits. Um, and so, so when you open the instrument, you'll see first that uh, we have a warming period that we need to uh, complete before we're allowed to move on with the rest of uh, the setup. Uh, this takes about 30 minutes, uh, which is why whenever you wanna use this uh, instrument, we recommend calling the lab ahead of time so that we can do all this stuff for you instead of you having to come here, waste a bit of your time uh, to do something that is fairly trivial. Uh, that will include this uh, system initialization uh, this is essentially uh, the, the um, Floridic startup and a bunch of tests that are run on the machine. So we have a series of beads that will be uh, running. Uh, the instrument will perform a series of measurements and just to make sure the machine is working properly. Uh, on this particular software, if the test fails, you're not allowed to move on with the experiment. And so uh, it's really critical that uh, you spend enough, of, enough time uh, to run these uh, these uh, these tests uh, and make them uh, perform properly, which is again why I'd recommend you calling ahead of time so we can take care of that uh, for you. For the purpose of this video, we're going to skip ahead to uh, actually setting up an actual experiment. So the first thing we're going to do is go to protocols and create a new protocol. So the protocol will contain all the information about the experiment that you're running. Um, you're going to be asked a series of questions, information about what you're actually doing. So uh, the name of the protocol, I recommend something that you'll be able to recognize. Your name and date typically will work just fine. Um, under acquisition settings, you have a series of uh, information that you want to enter regarding the way the instrument will run the plates. Uh, this information is available in the booklet if you're not quite sure what to enter. Um, I'd recommend 75 microliters, a timeout of 120 seconds, about two minutes per well. If the uh, count, the bead count does not reach its limit before that uh, timeout uh, uh, threshold, then it's going to stop the acquisition. So that prevents uh, the instrument to, from getting stuck on a plate where very few beads are present. It's going to basically run everything at a decent uh, speed regardless and not get stuck for every single well. Bead type is a very important one. For whatever reason, microplex is the default value. This is, I think it's a bead that is discontinued now. It's a smaller particle. Uh, and, and basically this is telling the software what voltage uh, to use to identify the beads. If you do not select the right beads, which are typically the magplex, the bigger ones, the magnetic beads, uh, the settings on the instrument might be off and you won't be able to measure uh, your, your experiment properly. So uh, this is a critical thing that uh, you need to uh, be aware of. Uh, job, joblet uh, discrimination gating. Again, the values are typically in your software, uh, in your uh, experimental booklet. Uh, it's going to be something around 5,000, 15,000 or, or whatever the manufacturers uh, uh, prefers. Reporter gain, uh, you can use default or high PMT in some case if you're looking at uh, really dim uh, expression of your uh, analytes. Analysis type in general will be quantitative and then you're going to be asked how many standards and how many controls you want to enter. Um, in general, I am going to uh, enter the number of standards, but not the number of controls simply because I'm lazy. If you enter a control over here later down the line, I'm gonna have to type in the characteristics of each of these controls, which I find tedious. And so I typically uh, do not enter the controls. So controls, we're talking about any um, control that was provided by the manufacturer within the kit. Uh, they have a specific a uh, range of uh, expression that it should reach for you to know that the kit is working properly. Um, and again, I just, I'm just i just gonna enter them as a regular sample. And later on, when you do your analysis, you can check on the values of these controls and, and see if they match whatever the manufacturers uh, wanted to uh, 
wanted them to. All right, so the next step is uh, entering the information about the end lights we're gonna be looking at. So the grid here represents the different beads, uh, a combination of dyes uh, that can stain those beads. There's a hundred different combinations uh, and each of these beads will represent the specific end lights uh, that you're gonna be uh, looking for in uh, your experiment. Now your certificate of analytes has uh, the list of analytes that you're looking for. Uh, and in parentheses, you should have uh, the bead number. Um, and so you simply enter these numbers in. Uh, so in this case, we have a bead 43, 19, 18, as well as 51, 44, and 45. 51, 44, 45. All right. At this point, you can go ahead and rename everything, uh, enter uh, the unit since general, it's gonna be picogram per mil. And the count, uh, it depends on your protocol. Typically it's either 50 beads uh, per analyte or 100 beads. Uh, again, the software will try to reach that threshold before it moves on to uh, the next well. All right, next step here, we are going to set up the layout on your plate. And we have a bunch of tools at the bottom. Uh, the replicate count tells us how many copies of the same uh, samples you are running on this plate. In general, we prefer duplicates for each of these uh, standards and controls. Um, you are simply going to select the wells uh, for any standard uh, samples, the background and controls, uh, and then and click on the type of wells that we're looking for. It did S1 on A1, B1, S2, C2, C1, D1, and so on. Uh, this is a function of the direction of uh, the plate over here. Uh, if I did S1 on A1, A, A2, and standard two on B1, B2, and so on, I want to change this orientation. Um, and so now I can make a correction by selecting these wells, removing them, and adding them right back. Uh, I can enter my blanks and then enter my actual samples. As I said before, if I'm running controls, they are going to be entered as normal samples here and not that control option, again, because I'm lazy. Um, now we have to rename all of these samples. They're called un unknown one, two, and so on, all the way to 40. Um, what you can do to help you out is uh, generate a list of the name of your samples in a simple uh, spreadsheet, or sorry, in a spread, simple uh, text file, um, all in one column. And once you have that ready, you can come over here and import this list. And now automatically the samples are gonna be uh, labeled properly. You wanna be careful about uh, the way the names are entered. For example, I probably made a mistake here. Um, my uh, orientation will force the naming strategy to go uh, lengthwise as opposed to per column. So a proper way, if you make a mistake like that, a better way to do it is simply, uh, you can actually re-import should say the uh, simple a second time around. So there you go. This is the proper way of entering these names. Uh, this is pretty much good to go at this point. So we're gonna save this. And now we're told uh, that the standards and controls do not have, have not been assigned to each of the wells. So this is what we're gonna do next. Uh, we're gonna go to standard and controls here. And now uh, we want to create the new standard and control lot based on the information I just entered in this experiment. And so as you create new lots, you can go find that experiment I just made. And now we need to enter this table uh, and information in this table over here. Uh, again, the name of your experiment, uh, kit lot number, 
is again on your certificate of analysis. An expiration date. Be mindful that if your kit has expired, uh, the instrument will not let you run uh, your experiment. And so you might, if you need to, to, to uh, lie uh, to the software, that's where you want to uh, do this. For each of these columns, we are asked to provide some information. So this might be like a rat, five flex. Uh, lot number, cut and paste is your friend here. And now uh, you have to enter um, the standard one concentration values, again, present in your certificate of analysis. Um, and now we need to fill out the rest of this table. So here's a quick tip for every column where the information is the same, you can highlight them and click on this button over here. It's gonna apply values downwards. And now for these values uh, where we did a, um, for my standard curve, I did the dilution. The dilution factor is found in your protocol and you can simply uh, apply a specific dilution that you've made. So say it's one and four apply the dilution to all of these wells here, and it's gonna automatically enter uh, the values uh, below. Um, at the bottom of this window, we have the information about the controls. Uh, if you really want to, you can actually tell the software that you've entered uh, the controls properly in the software and tell it where they are. At this point, we'll have to tell the information about uh, the expected concentration, the lowest, the highest values, uh, and so it's basically three times this uh, table. Um, and again, it just gets very, very tedious. And I typically do not want to uh, do that. So we're gonna simply save at this point. Let's run the plate. We're gonna go to batches and I'm gonna go to uh, create a new batch from an existing protocol that I just uh, created. Uh, I can go and fish out the protocol Um, before I select it, I'm going to enter a batch name here. And this is going to be the name uh, of the data file that you're going to generate at the end of this experiment. And so this is important that you give it the name that's going to be uh, recognizable. And so uh, your name and date, again, is a good idea. Uh, that data will end up on the server later on, and that's how you're going to find uh, your files. It, you'll find later all these information we just entered. So this is information about uh, the standard curve and my plate layout with all the names and so on, just the way we recorded it. So at this point, you're ready to run uh, your plate. Click the eject button to open the uh, robotic arm that will move your plate around, uh, load your plate and simply uh, click on the run batch. Right, so typically, uh, Plate should take 45 minutes to read. So as you run your plate, you're gonna get something like uh, this. Uh, this window will basically list uh, the fluorescent values uh, as they are being measured for each of the different satellites uh, that you are looking at. In general, you'll have a um, run status uh, table here or column that lets you know if uh, everything uh, was run properly. Every now and then you'll get a warning telling you that uh, something went wrong. Uh, very often this warning is triggered by the fact that you didn't reach uh, the uh, lowest threshold of bead count uh, before we moved on to uh, the acquisition. Um, and one way to make sure is simply to go to the statistic uh, box here and select uh, the count. So count actually tells us how many beads were uh, counted. And I can see here I have a 48. Uh, maybe I have other issues down the line. 49, 44. So in this case, some of these wells, uh, some of these analytes, uh, we didn't count enough events for uh, the whole uh, acquisition. 
And uh, after the time lapse, the instrument just moved on to the next well. At the bottom of the window, we find the doublet discrimination table. So these are the values we've entered at the beginning uh, when we set up uh, the experiment template. Uh, it should be somewhere between 5,000, 15,000, 25,000, depending. Uh, this is the peak of single cells. Anything below is typically just noise and uh, debris. And the second graph, we have the classification one and two. So these are uh, essentially different concentration of dyes for each of these beads that we're looking for. They kind of cluster together, as you can see, uh, in nice, really uh, nice uh, spots on the graphs. Each of them represents one of your analytes. And the tiny dots are each uh, a single bead that uh, has been measured. At the end of the acquisition, the data is transferred uh, to the desktop in this folder called exponent output. And what you get is, uh, in general, a CSV file that will contain uh, all the information that was measured. Um, and so you have a series of information about the instrument that you use, the name of the operator, all this stuff at the top. And then um, all these uh, measurements for um, the median, uh, the net MFI, the count, and all these things have been saved within that uh, CSV file. That that's, so, so that's the raw data. To analyze your data, we're going to use the Belisa software. And all you really need to do is simply uh, find your data file and dump it right into the software. It will automatically calculate uh, the standard curve for each of the analytes and the concentration for each of your samples. From there, you can simply export uh, the data as an Excel spreadsheet and proceed with your analysis um, any way you want. Once you're done with the experiment, we ask people to clean after themselves. In this case, all you need to do is click on the shutdown button uh, and you're uh, directed to uh, the auto maintenance page. You're gonna be asked to fill the XMAP technology plate uh, with a bunch of DI water at the top and bleach at the bottom. The bottles are available next to the machine. Uh, put that in place in the instrument. Uh, let it run for about five minutes. Once it's done, take the plate out. At that point, uh, you can safely close the software, log out of Windows, and you are basically done with your Luminex experiment.